Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Fall 22 University Town Hall. I'm Denise Gimlin. I'm the Staff Senate President, and I'm joined today by Susan Castro, Faculty Senate President, our President Rick Muma, Zach Gerhart, Chief of Staff, and many other titles, and Shirley Lefevre, our uh, Provost. Um, we would. I'm just going to let Rick say a few words, and and we'll go from there. Well, thank you, uh, Denise and Susan, for um, uh, putting this together and, and continuing to host these uh, uh, town halls uh, for the university. We really appreciate it. And um, thank you all for being here. Uh, those that are you, those of you who are watching it, thank you for for being here today, and thank you for all the work that you do on a regular basis. We really appreciate it. And looking forward to answering any questions you may have. Um, I'm assuming uh, Denise and Susan will remind you to put those in the, the chat uh, comment dialogue box so we can see what those are. So looking forward to the afternoon. Thank you, President Yuma. Shirley, did you have any comments you wanted to add before we start answering questions? Sure. I will also just say hello to all of you and I appreciate the opportunity to, to answer questions and share some updates. Great. Thank you very much. Susan, I think you had a question. I do. I'm first up. So, Rick, I know a lot of faculty are concerned with what happened at Emporia State University. Can you tell us how WSU is preparing itself to avoid being in that situation? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Great question. And um, what I'll just say, uh, a real simple answer um, is that it's what we've been doing all along. Um, as many of you know, that we've been trying to um, deal with um, cuts and, and different adjustments that we have to take uh, that's, that's served up through legislative changes, the Board of Regents changes, and we've, we've handled that internally. But one of the things that we've done all along is to invest in, in the institution. And primarily that investment's been around recruitment and retention. And so, as you know, if you read the, uh, the news today, we're, we're growing as an institution and we're really the only institution in the state that is. We grew about 5% in headcount and 4.4% in FTE. Uh, that's why we're in a different position than Poria State. Now, from what I've heard and, and what I've read is that that has not been the case. They have not been, uh, they've been cutting, but they haven't been reinvesting in, into programs and, um, you know, in, in areas that, that are growing and are demand by students, but also um, trying to recruit, retain students. And, and that's been a major focus. As, as many of you know, um, we have invested a lot of, a lot of resources into that. And that's why we're in a, in a much better position um, than some of our other sister institutions. Thank you for that response, Rick. And that really touches on my question, which is relative to our enrollment numbers, which were out today. Did you want to talk about, I know you did touch on that with a 5% growth, but do you want to shout from the ceiling a little bit more about how great our numbers are looking? Yeah, and if you saw the WSU Today article, or, or if you've seen the news coverage on this, if, if you look at all of our enrollment here at Wichita State main campus, in our locations and WSU Tech's locations, we're almost at 22,000 students. We're about 16,921 students here on Wichita State's campuses, um, which is phenomenal. We're getting back to the numbers uh, that we were back in the 70s and 80s. A lot of that enrollment increase is driven by the people in this community, particularly among Hispanic students but also graduate students and international students. And that's very helpful as we continue to um, make sure that we have the revenues that we need to uh, continue to operate in, in a productive way and also invest in, in programs and people um, and students as we move forward. Um, uh, we'll, we'll be releasing additional information about this as we move forward. Uh, a lot of the driver of enrollment in the program areas is, is around uh, computer science, data science, business analytics, digital arts, cybersecurity, uh, human resource management. Um, those are the, the areas that a lot of students are interested in at this point. So we need to be focused on that and make sure that we continue to grow those areas. As you know, that's been also a focus of our institution in terms of digital transformation. And the Innovation Campus is really shaped up to be a dig digital ecosystem so there's a match there as well so we'll continue to to move those uh, particular initiatives forward and, and make sure that we're providing uh, uh, 
the, what students uh, need and also what students want in terms of their future, being mindful that we need to respond to uh, our, our business and industry partners or community agencies, whoever hires our students, be mindful that, that we're responding to that and helping um, uh, put talent out there and grow jobs for our, for our, for our community. So um, uh, that's what we'll continue to do. I think that's all very positive news. And nothing really works unless you're growing. Um, and, and if you look at any organization, um, uh, ones that are successful are growing. That doesn't seem like a really hard concept um, to think about, but that's what we have to always be focused on. Uh, as the population of students will shrink over the upcoming years, the more we can position ourselves um, to uh, attract students here and provide uh, relevant opportunities for them is going to make us uh, to be a very sustainable institution going forward. Okay. Um Switching from enrollment numbers, we have several projects going on, lots of things in progress. Um, can you tell us a little bit about highlights of what's going on with our developments? Yeah, so we have some slides. Um, Caleb, if you can pull those up um, um, to, uh, once you go to the next slide, actually that's the enrollment slide. Once you go back to that slide, Caleb, I, I didn't ask you to pull that up. Um, this is just the trend line of our enrollments over, over time since fall of 1895 when we had 28 students when we started this institution and you can see where we ended up um, almost at 17,000 students that's our goal for 2025 to be consistently at 17,000 students so we can't say yay we made that um, until we're consistently at that number over time um, and you can see we're, we're real close to that WSU Tech also has a goal of being about 6,500 students by 2025 and they're well on their way as well this trend line does not represent WSU Tech's numbers, just Wichita State main campus and uh, the, the additional locations that we have. Okay, so we'll move on to the next slide, but what Susan was asking about. Um, so uh, as you know, there's a lot of projects. I've talked about this in the various college town halls. Not everybody has been in those town halls, so I'm gonna cover it here too. This is our latest campus map um, of uh, projects that have been completed or in the process of being started or um, uh, in, the, in the future. So let me just go through the, the next slide as well. And we'll start with uh, projects that you'll see some movement on over this next year. Um, I'll start on the left-hand side in the bottom portion of that slide. You're all familiar with the Shocker Success Center. Now that this Barton School of Business has moved into Woolsey Hall, um, uh, which is in the center of this um, map. Uh, uh, we now have the opportunity to renovate that facility into a, a, a very a state of the art um, shocker, what we're going to call a shocker success center, which is going to bring together about 17 offices into that facility. And it's a perfect location because it's right next to the library and also to the RSC. Now, you're probably thinking, oh my God. That's a horrible building, um, the way it looks on the inside. Well, we're going to completely renovate this facility and gut it. You won't recognize it um, on the outside and on the inside, especially it'll be opened up. The floors will be opened up. Um, and, and, and you'll see the kind of spaces that you see in the RSC and Wolsey Hall, you know, modern ways of, of, uh, of how students um, get together and want to, get, want, want to work together and study together. So that's what you'll see in that building. Um, we are already have secured the funding for, for that project. It's about $18.5 million project. Um, a third of it comes from private donations. A third of it comes from a student fee increase. And the rest of it comes from uh, resources that the university has been holding back to help support student success. And we're gonna, we have already bonded that facility and we'll start construction probably in January. It wasn't gonna start in October, but there's been some uh, identification of additional asbestos in that facility. Um, who, are, who would have ever thought that? Um, and it's gonna push back that start date until, until January of 2023 with a completion um, date of probably summer of 2024. It's about a 14 month project. Um, at the kickoff, I talked about Cessna Stadium and the need to do something with that particular project. Uh, um, you know, that facility is in its current form open in the late 60s. 
really hasn't been a lot of um, updates to it. We, it was obviously built for football. We no longer have football. We have no plans of bringing back football. And I'll just say this, if a president wanted to bring football back to the campus, it's not a big enough footprint to, to have a modern facility that people would want to come and sit and watch um, a football team play. And so um, we've decided that we need to take care of this. I now know why previous presidents have not done anything about this uh, because it's complex. Uh, we we want to make sure they preserve the state track meet and preserve it also and improve it for our own track team. Um, so it has to be staged. It's very expensive. And no one's lining up really to tear a facility down. But they don't they don't want to do that. They're, they're, they're more interested in um, us tearing it down and then and then um, uh, perhaps invest in it. So you see that rendering there, it's pointing to where that facility is. So what we're planning on uh, making this more of a multi-purpose, multi-use facility with potential entertainment, concert venue at that facility. What you're gonna see starting next summer, um, the Board of Trustees gave us approval this past week um, to start the, the, the initial phases of this project, which um, include tearing down the east side of the of the facility starting next summer and then the following summer um, uh, redoing the track and field and putting a regulation soccer field in there um, for the possibility of future soccer um, uh, women's soccer most likely um, and so there won't be a, a, a stand built back on the east side but what there will be is a, a grassy bermed area that will allow for seating um, of about 2,300 individuals in that particular area. There'll also be some restrooms and some other infrastructure, but also um, a place where we could uh, have, uh, have staging of, of concerts. So um, more to come about that. There's been some articles in the Business Journal and the Eagle that you can refer to about more information. The other one that I want to talk about that's going to start soon too, probably in January, we received a private gift to add an addition to Marcus Welcome Center. This is something that actually I've been working on um, ever since I was in the provost office. I've always thought that we needed to do a better job of um, showing the full life cycle of what it means to be a shocker here uh, at Wichita State. Um, and, and to combine uh, a, an area where you see the admissions office or career development or experiential learning, applied learning offices, a Shocker Career Accelerator, all into one facility. So when a student shows up to Wichita, Wichita State, the moment they show up, they can see that full life cycle, what it means to be a Shocker here. And we're gonna reconfigure some of the uh, entry spaces there and the way that students actually walk through that facility, which will open up into the innovation campus area. And they can see some of the opportunities that will be available to them. So that's very exciting. Um, and that'll take about 10 months to construct that addition. Um, once we open up Shocker Hall, or excuse me, Shocker Success Center and the Marcus Welcome Center addition, then the folks that are located in uh, Brennan Hall 1, 2, and 3 will be moved out of those facilities, um, either located in these facilities or in the facilities that other offices are um, currently located that move into the Shocker Success Center. Um, and we'll have all of these these offices centrally located. And we're going to tear down Brennan Hall one, two, and three. It's it's a, an old those are old facilities. It adds to our deferred maintenance, and it costs us money um, to maintain those facilities. Uh, also, just so you know, um, Intensive English has moved to Linquist Hall, and um, so they've already moved out of the two buildings at 17th and, and Hillside, and we're going to tear down those facilities this year. Again, removing them from our deferred maintenance uh, uh, list and, 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 and burden that we have to maintain those facilities. So Caleb, if you can go back to that slide again. And the last building on there that you see, you know that we received a $51 million grant. Um, uh, it was from the, uh, the Economic Development Administration Department of Commerce, U.S. Department of Commerce. Once you understand that that was a very key grant to capture, it's very um, competitive. 600 different universities, organizations across the country applied for that. Um, we were identified as a finalist, and, uh, one of 60, and then ultimately one of 21 that were funded. 
And what this facility is meant to, to do is to um, take our expertise that we already have in advanced manufacturing and smart manufacturing um, and to try to uh, create more adoption opportunities of that technology in smaller businesses. Um, so there'll be research space in this area along with uh, uh, educational space. This will be located just east of the Woolsey Hall School of Business. So you'll see construction on this project um, starting uh, in the spring. Um, there's about $36 million uh, that's going to be a part of that grant to, to build this facility. And then there's also uh, being proposed space for faculty to use as well as research space. And uh, Provost Lefebvre is working with the deans on that to um, work through that uh, particular uh, aspect of the project. So Caleb, you can go to the next slide. Um, I also want to just update you on um, where, where we're at on additional construction projects on the Innovation Campus. I want to make sure everybody is understanding of how the Innovation Campus is uh, uh, funded and how it is uh, managed. And, and one of the first things that you need to know is that the, the actual north, um, uh, what that be, northeast corner of the map up there, uh, at the corner of 21st and Oliver, extending down to 18th Street and Oliver. That land has already been leased out to a developer uh, before my time um, to develop partnership buildings and other amenities on that side of the campus. Um, they, they built Starbucks, they built Brayburn Square, um, they built the, the partnership building that's just um, west of the crash lab at 18th and Oliver. Uh, they built the, the smart factory that Deloitte uh, is, is housed in, um, and they built Airbus building um, as well. Um, so uh, you may know that um, or heard that ATF has been working with our School of Criminal Justice for a while on various different things. Um, they have been um, uh, intimately involved in some of the newer technologies that you see in the criminal justice field. Um, they have been intrigued by our expertise in um, digital transformation, digital twinning. Um, and so they're moving their R&D, their entire R&D operation that supports their gun crime intelligence um, uh, operations to the innovation campus. And they're going to be located in that building that um, is just west of the, the, the crash lab, which is at the corner of 18th and Oliver. Um, it's, it's kind of the, that building that you see that's just right in the middle of those two blue um, future buildings. And they have plans to build an additional building that you see just to the west of that building. And then the developers are going to build an additional building, which is just south of the Hyatt Place Hotel, right there on the water, um, to allow for other partners to be considered coming to Wichita State. So. Um, those are in the works, and uh, you'll see the ATF moving into that uh, initial facility um, in the spring. Let's go back up to the corner of, of, of this map, and you can see some arrows pointing to um, some uh, maroon colored buildings. Um, uh, the developers have done a study and have determined that there's uh, demand for additional housing, not student housing, but housing that um, people, anybody could uh, uh, rent an apartment. And so they're going to, and they're currently in pro process of putting together a plan to um, build some apartments on the other side of Brayburn Square. Um, and then just um, uh, south of those two buildings, um, uh, there is another building that they have, they have evaluated, and which is a multi-purpose a building um, to allow for conference space, gathering space, um, that's also in the works. Uh, just an update on Brayburn Square, where there's we have fuzzies and social tap and shocker store, there's a credit union there, Meritrust. Um, there's also going to be a Jersey's Mike, a Jersey Mike's sandwich shop and a I can't remember the name of it, a gourmet corn dog shop that's going to go into that uh, facility. Um, and then Pedigo, which is a bicycle shop, motorized bicycle uh, shop that um, has a location in Bradley Fair. They're going to also put a, a location into this facility. So that's 
that's going to pretty much uh, finish off that uh, particular space. And, and so that's why uh, the developers are working on these apartments, but also additional retail space that's going to be associated with those apartments as well. So let's go to the next slide. So these are things that we're thinking about, proposed, um, still having conversations about. Let's start on the left-hand bottom part of that slide. Um, uh, the University Village concept was started a couple of years ago. We have all kinds of uh, public comments and uh, presentations on this. Uh, I already talked about um, when we tear down Brennan Hall 1, 2, and 3. It opens up some space there that could be potentially used for development. Um, and then we have two parking lots that are there as well. And of course, the area at 17th and Hillside. And so we've been working with the community. They, they'd like to see a, a more intentional connection to the university, to Fairmount neighborhood. You know, they, want, they want to see a grocery store. They want to see um, a drug store. They want improved lighting. They want um, improved connections to the university. Um, and so we have um, been talking to developers and there is some interest, but we're uh, still pretty early in the process uh, before we would do anything um, to green light that particular project. But just so you know, that's, that's where we are there, in case you've been following that. Right in the middle of this map, um, you'll see two little yellow buildings um, that are uh, on the flats, an uh, uh, extension of the flats, uh, the residence hall. We're not in the in a position right now to think that we need to uh, build additional housing, um, even though we've had some increased enrollments, particularly at the first time in college student level. We want to make sure that we're really careful about not building for a high watermark. So we'll, we'll have to study this a little bit longer. But we do have some um, uh, supporters who are interested in helping us potentially build additions. So we're trying to figure out what that would cost should we want to move forward. Um, in that particular um, area of our campus. And then back to 21st and Oliver, if the apartments that they build right on the, uh, on the east side of the, of the pond, associated with Braeburn Square, are successful, then there's plans for additional apartments there. There's also um, space um, for a freestanding restaurant just um, south of Braeburn Square and also east of Hyatt Place Hotel. So that's possibilities there. Again, that's all been leased out already to developers. And as, as we continue to grow and, and, and create more demand, those kinds of things um, uh, are likely to, to, to happen in the future. And that just leads us to three plots of land that we have no plans for at this particular time. We're always looking for and talking to different partners who are interested in joining our campus. Um, you know, now that we've created a, a, this digital ecosystem on the innovation campus and um, we're growing our student population, we have more and more um, companies who are interested in, uh, in joining uh, our campus. So right there at 17th and Oliver, there's a small lot and then there's two lots just east of where Woolsey Hall is located. Um, and those, that's where those two buildings um, would be situated should they um, uh, come to fruition. So. Um, that brings us back to the next slide um, uh, and to talk a little bit about the biomedical campus that the, the legislature uh, provided $35 million last year to both KU and WSU um, to kickstart that particular um, project. Um, this is a gap in our community. We do not have a health science center, health science education center, academic health science center, whatever you want to call it, which is an interprofessional grouping of health healthcare provider programs, um, working together, housed together, sharing resources, um, truly working in an interprofessional way. We know that through research over a number of years that if you train individuals in that way, um, you, you improve patient outcomes. In the community, we, we spend a lot of time um, addressing uh, aerospace, manufacturing, agriculture, transportation, logistics, but what this community has not addressed is healthcare. If, if this community is going to grow or, or wants to grow, um, this is an area that needs to be addressed. And so any community that you see that, that has the, this kind of thing, and, and it's in communities that are growing or want, want to grow, um, you see 
this very enriching experience for students, um, but also it brings in innovation and research and just really um, uh, blossoms after that. I, I was trained in the largest health science center in the world, the Texas Medical Center in Houston. Um, and uh, that's what you see. And it's a very enriching experience for students, but also uh, spurs off um, or spins off all kinds of research and innovation in the community. So that's very exciting. Our, our focus with KU this legislative session is to secure funding um, to bond a, a facility, uh, utilize the 35 million that we already have received from them, which is ARPA dollars, by the way, um, that came from uh, coronavirus relief funding from the federal government. Uh, if you go to the next slide, Caleb, um, you'll see these facilities in the core of the city. Um, you know, people question, so why is it going to be on our innovation campus? Well, there's really no room for that because this will be about a 450,000 square foot facility, 300 million um, at, at the top amount of price of the facility. And we've already created a lot of uh, uh, healthcare infrastructure in, in the core of our city. You look at this map, you see Via Christi uh, in, at, at the top and in, in, the, in the north part of, of that uh, L-shaped uh, shaded area. You have Comcare um, in the south part of it, south of um, Douglas. We have the osteopathic medical school. We have a culinary institute. It's going to have a food service component for, for students down there. And so we're likely um, haven't selected a location yet. The city has some space for us that they'd like us to consider. Um, likely it be around um, uh, just north of Interest Bank Arena, northwest of Interest Bank Arena, adjacent to all these areas. Um, and when you bring these things together, you address things like, um, uh, in, you know, shortages of health care, homelessness, mental health, those sorts of things. Um, so that, that's really the gist of the project. So Caleb, if you go to the next slide, that brings us back to our main campus slide where we started. Um, and Susan, that's um, basically where I'll end that particular topic. Thank you. So a lot going on. Yes. Next question is for Shirley, Provost Lefevre. There's been a lot of discussion about program review at the Board of Regents. Do you have any information that you can share about the RPK study that's currently underway? Sure. So for those of you who do not know, RPK is a consulting group that uh, the Board of Regents have hired to work with each of the six institutions to basically to see where there might be some efficiencies across the system. Um, so right now they're in their data collection, data analysis phase. So they're, they've asked us to submit information on what programs we currently offer, what our faculty workload is, um, what the enrollments are in the, the programs that we offer. And then they will uh, submit their recommendations or their findings to the Board of Regents by the end of December. And then we anticipate the Board of Regents to come back with criteria or recommendations for each of the six institutions as we consider, um, as we do our program, annual program reviews each, um, that we submit to KBOR. So um, right now we don't really know what their recommendations will be, um, but we do know that they are looking to increase efficiency across the six institutions. Hey, uh, Susan, can I make a comment about that? So it's come up in town halls uh, with Shirley and I about, you know, what's what's the faculty involvement that's going to be um, as we move forward. And um, just like we always have with program review, you know, it's one of the first things that I was tasked to do when I moved into the provost's office about 10 years ago is to develop a really robust program review process that's based on quality improvement, um, you know, making sure that the departments are all uh, focused around everything they can do to show their their value, the outcomes, uh, and so forth. And I, I just want to make you all uh, aware that, um, you know, times have changed over the last several years. There's all, all kinds of accountability, not just from uh, the Board of Regents, but also the state, the governor, uh, our students. And so we need to make sure that all of us take this really serious um, and, and make sure that we show the value of our uh, programs that we're offering. 
Um, and, and how can you um, uh, modify those programs to make them more attractive to students? You know, we all believe that all of our programs as is should be attractive <laughs> to students, but not every program is viewed that way, particularly the current student body that we're, that we're receiving at our institution. Um, so every year you need to be cognizant about how you can show um, the value of your program. You know, when I was a chair back in the day at this institution, every year I had an annual report and I gave it to my dean and said, Here, here's where we are in terms of our program. Here's, here's how we're attracting students. This is what we're doing to make improvements. We all need to be aware. That's what the regents are looking for. Now, thankful that program review process that we've had in place for a number of years has done that. We're growing. It, it, it doesn't cause as much pain points that, uh, as other institutions like Emporia that's uh, having some struggles right now. We don't want to be in that situation um, going forward. And But I want you to know that we are committed for you, or Shirley and I are committed that, that you all will be involved in this process, but you also have to meet us in the middle too and, and talk about, well, maybe we, we don't need to be doing that anymore. Uh, maybe we need to get rid of that minor. Maybe we need to not do a certificate. Maybe we should modify the curriculum, make it more attractive to, to recruit students. So um, need to be much more open-minded about how we can um, make improvements so we don't have to think about making really difficult decisions going forward. Thank you for that. Before we move on to the next question, I just wanted to remind our audience that if you do have a question, feel free to drop it in the chat. Um, we have gotten a few and we will get to those um, when we get through a couple of other items here. Um, my next question, Rick, is um, over the last few years, the university has been able to provide faculty and staff with additional administrative leave days uh, during the holiday shutdown. Is that something that's being discussed this year? Well, um, good question. Um, uh, we have had this conversation up the regions, particularly with the presidents. Uh, all of us have talked about this. Um, the board um, uh, during COVID interpreted the policies to mean uh, that, that, that this could be allowed in extenuating circumstances. Um, now that we're moving past COVID slowly but surely, um, uh, they, they have um, uh, decided that that's not something that they're willing to allow us to do. However, uh, the six presidents have been talking about that. So I'm not totally ruling it out, but right now we don't have any plans to do that uh, uh, because of these conversations that we've had up at the board level. That's disappointing, but maybe there's still some hope. So um, my next question is for Provost Lefevre. Shirley, what's the latest update on this and the DEI plan? Where do we stand? So the NIS is the National Institute for Student Success. And again, the Board of Regents hired um, the consultants from NIS to work with each of the, the six institutions to look at what we're doing in terms of retention and um, the equity gap between um, how our underserved students are progressing through graduation and our uh, total student population. So um, they last year went through a data collection period and, and they um, in May gave us our specific recommendations for WSU. And um, so it's the evidence is really clear that we, there's a lot we can do at Wichita State to improve our retention rates, particularly for our underserved student body. And so What's very, very important is that every single one of us views this as something that we own and we can all be a part of. And um, so it's it's a campus-wide effort. We do have every plan to change the tra trajectory in our retention rates. Right now, uh, we have a gap of 13% between our underserved students and our uh, total student population. That's, that's much too large. We really have to reverse that trend. And we have about a 70% retention rate compared to um, our aspirational peers. That's, that's lower than our aspirational peers. So we have to get, get that going. The four specific recommendations that they came back with for WSU was uh, first being to systematize the use of academic data to identify courses with high non-pass rates. 
um, and and to implement tactics that are going to improve our student success in those courses. The second recommendation was is to standardize academic advising so that every student, regardless of their major, receives the same and consistent support uh, in terms of their advising. The third is to develop intentional pathways so that students can make informed decisions when they make when they transfer, sorry, when they change majors. Uh, we know that right now when students change, a lot of times when students change majors, they lose credits along the way. And, and we wanna minimize the impact of changing a major on a student's pathway to graduation. And then the last recommendation they had for us is to strengthen our fi financial aid supports. Uh, you heard President Muma talk about the investments we've made in uh, need-based aid. Our um, WSU Foundation has been uh, phenomenal in raising need-based funds for need-based aid. So we've invested in that, but we also, there are other things we can do as well. Um, so financial literacy, really promoting uh, students, um, financial literacy and um, increasing FAFSA completion rates. So that's where we're at. We have a NIST implementation group that's that's broad-based. It has representation from all of the colleges on it, as, as well as all of the SIM uh, members. So uh, we're, we're working towards a, reversing the trend. Thank you for that, Shirley. It sounds like there's a lot of work going on on this process. Hey, Denise. Um, uh, yeah, you know, I, I don't, I, I'm not shy, and um, I feel like I, I'd also like to just um, reinforce uh, what Shirley's um, talked about in terms of this. And Shirley, I think they also want to know about DEI. But before you talk about that, um, you know, obviously, all of us uh, want our students to be successful, and we want them to graduate on time. We certainly want to make sure that there's no difference between. Uh, students who are, are, are here at this institution in terms of their graduation records, <clears throat> uh, underserved or non-underserved. And we also want them to be successful along their way and, and, and that they're, they persist and, and, and they have a good experience. And if you didn't think that that was enough, um, the other real reason that you need to, to think about here is that every 1% increase of retention um, at our institution among first time and college students, it's about $500,000 in additional revenues. And so if that's not good enough for you as a reason why to do this, then it's, it's a moral imperative. We're taking dollars from our students um, for their educational experience. And remember, they're paying for most of it, uh, their educational experience. It's not like when we were in, in college where um, the state, uh, at least this state and most other states were paying about 80% of our education. And so these are all the reasons why we need to do it. But here's the last thing I want to say about it. What's different now is that the Board of Regents has this as a priority that they are asking all the Regent schools to decrease the equity gap. All students, no matter their background, should be graduating at the same rate. Um, and so this is another driver of, 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 of addressing this. And it's not that we haven't been addressing it, but we haven't been intentional about it, as Shirley has said. So we, we really need to make sure that we work on that. And here's, the, I said that was the final thing, but I have one more thing to say about this. Um, what's also different is that the Board of Regents is holding me accountable for this, and I'm holding the executive team accountable for this. Who's holding, Shirley's holding the deans and other folks across campus that report to her accountable for this. So this has to be a priority, our number one priority, as we move, move forward. Long-term sustainability of this institution is gonna be dependent on whether we have students who persist on a regular, uh, timely basis and graduate from this institution. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody understood a, a broader context of, of why we're at this point. Thanks, Rick. I knew you'd jump in. Um, I did want to, I know, Shirley, you were going to talk about DI, and my question kind of ties to that because it's about the market-based compensation study that was completed last year, or the first, the first phase was completed last year, um, and I know that's built into the DEI plan. Um, as far as compensation, then you can talk about the DI plan in general, 
Uh, where are we planning going forward with that for the marketplace-based compensation plan? Yeah, I can start that question and, and uh, President Muma may want to chime in as well, but it, this was the first year of our um, approach to making sure that our salaries are attractive and equitable. So um, we know that it's going to take more than one year to get our salaries where we want them to be. So um, it's a work in progress. So I would just say, um, ask every question that you have, make sure that you, you're you clear on uh, why, why your salary is the way it is. We don't want anyone to be confused about that. And then, and then also be patient. We're, we're still, we had some, we, I think we invested about 4 million and I can't remember Rick, if that's right, six of our, million. our resources internally, six million. you know, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Million. So, um, so we're going to still, we still have a commitment to make sure that we address that need. So, and you did mention that it is a cornerstone of our uh, DEI plan. That is one of the, that is the reason that we started this work for market-based compensation is to make sure that our salaries were equitable and, and um, attractive. The other thing uh, in terms of the DEI plan, if you go to the website, just type in diversity, equity, and inclusion or DEI, and it'll take you right there. But you, you'll go and see that um, we have a number of tactics identified. Each of those are aligned to the five strategic goals. Uh, so uh, we spent a lot of time last year trying to solicit feedback from campus constituents. We listened, we tried to incorporate the, that feedback into the, the plan that you'll see on the website. And so now we are at a place where um, the, the President's Diversity Council is taking a look at each of those tactics, prioritizing them and determining what resources we can align to those uh, priorities. So um, again, that's a work in progress. The other piece to that is each of the colleges were asked to um, articulate their own DEI plan and uh, align those to the university DEI plan. Thank you, Shirley. Um, I would like to take a moment to welcome our new uh, director of Human Resources, Vicki Wiesenhans. Um, she will be instrumental in helping us with the market-based compensation plan this year. Um, please, everyone, be nice to her and give her a chance. <laughs> and uh, last question from me. This is for Zach Hearhart. Can you give us an idea of what the board is asking in terms of their legislative budget request and how that might impact the university's budget, also related to market-based compensation in the end? Uh, absolutely. Uh, glad to be here. Caleb, if you could put on the legislative update slide, please. Thank you. So I'll talk about this briefly. Uh, the state's appropriation to us is significant. It's about 20% of our overall university budget. Um, so I think it's a good idea to talk about what the regents are prioritizing for this upcoming session. I do want to mention that we do have elections coming up on November 8th. Obviously, be sure to go out and vote. Um, but as part of that process, too, President Muma and myself and Andy Schlapp have been meeting with legislative candidates talking about higher education, its impact on our community, our workforce, our economy. Um, so I've been staying very, very busy with that. So KBOR this year uh, in their most recent meeting announced they're going to ask for 250 more or $254 million in new appropriations requests. So this is by far the largest Ooh. request that uh, we've had since I've been here. It's about twice the size of last year's, but the state also has a large ending balance of over a billion dollars. So um, large, ambitious, but it's probably the time to dream big. They're really focused on growth, not just for the sake of growing enrollment, although that is important from a budgetary standpoint for the universities, but also to fulfill its mission uh, for the building the talent pipeline for our industry partners. So they're asking eight and a half million each for NIS and for SIM. So when the president says that NIS is a priority, uh, he truly does mean it from the board all the way down into the individual universities and the colleges. Uh, so uh, critical that we do what we can as a university to support that as the regents are going out and asking for new resources to help support that as well. 
expanding student financial aid, as you remember, we asked for $25 million last year for need-based aid, and really Wichita State and President Muma were the ones really driving that request to grow access and affordability. We pale in comparison to a lot of states in the Midwest. Uh, ultimately, last session, we got about $19 million, and the lion's share of that is going to Wichita State. Um, the regents this year are asking for $24 million in new financial aid resources to help grow that effort. It's not lost on the Board of Regents or the state as a whole that uh, inflation is a growing issue. So they're asking $25 million to help address that and the cost of doing business increasing, and then also to uh, deal with growing costs in other areas such as IT, uh, $20 million. And then as you know, this is kind of the second year that the facility renewal policy has been into effect. So to kind of help drive that from a state level, they're asking for $35 million um, for facility renewal to help address deferred maintenance, then $10 million specifically for the demolition of buildings. Wichita Biomedical Campus, as the president mentioned, is a priority for the institution. And to help kind of finish the funding for that, we are asking the state, as is KU Medical Center, for $10 million each for a bond to help satisfy the rest of that project. Uh, Susan, kind of answering, answering your question about uh, market-based pay and how the state's appropriation fits into that, um, I would be shocked uh, if there wasn't something from the state to, to address that, whether it's a proposal by the governor or a legislator. I can't really speak with any certainty until we see how the elections pan out and also what the state's fiscal situation ends up being. Um, but I will say that inflationary adjustment number does help uh, make that possible from an internal aspect as we uh, get some money there, potentially it helps free up internal resources. So. That's what I would say about that. So uh, Susan, Denise, I'll go ahead and hand it back to you. Thank you, Zach. Um, we do have a couple questions in the chat. Um, I've got one that's related to development, so I'm gonna ask that one. Um, the intensive English buildings being torn down, but what about the Garvey International Center at 17th and Hillside? Is that gonna be torn down as well? No, it's not. Um... Uh, that's sort of the administrative headquarters of international education um, with uh, some uh, additional um, uh, thought around student services. There is some work being done on um, uh, how can we provide better international education services to international students on the center part of our campus. Um, that's why we moved the intensive English to Linguist Hall um, or one of the reasons. Uh, but also, um, we, we know that we need other student-facing offices uh, on the main campus. But <clears throat> that will still leave that building there for the, the sort of the back office, administrative offices. Um, and so we don't have any plans to, uh, to tear down that facility. Great. Thank you. Um, still on the tearing down of buildings, another question was, when are Brendan Hall buildings uh, slated to be torn down? So as I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, the construction of the Shocker Success Center and the addition of the Marcus Welcom Center, once those are completed, uh, we'll be able to shift all those folks who are in those facilities currently um, uh, to move them to the main campus, either in the Shocker Success Center or the addition to the Marcus Welcom Center or in offices where uh, offices that are moving to the Shocker Success Center are vacating um, on campus. So. That's not going to be probably until the summer or fall of 2024. Okay, um, quick reminder, um, what is NIS and what is SEM? What does that stand for? <laughs> oh, so NIS stands for the National Institute for Student Success and um, I can tell you more about that if you want. And then SIM, SCM is um, Strategic Enrollment Management. Thank you. Um, Denise, you want to take the last question? Um, I have a couple of questions that were in the kind of a direct message. One of them is, are there any plans now or in the future for WSU students, faculty or staff or dependents to have an opportunity for tuition assistance for WSU Tech? 
That's a great question. Um, uh, we haven't had any conversations about that, but we can certainly take that back to the executive team and, of course, to um, uh, Sherry Utash, president of, of WSU Tech, and see what she thinks about that. I will say that I do know someone who has a spouse that works at WSU Tech and has asked the opposite, that you okay. know, yeah. could their employees come here, could our employees go there and have that tuition assistance possibility be there? We have uh, uh, provided um, WSU Tech employees ability to enroll in badges uh, at no cost. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, Shirley and I, or Shirley in particular, can follow up on, on that particular yeah. issue. Okay, so as a reminder, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and we'll try to get them answered. Um, we have one last question to answer. Um, Maybe it's already been answered. Market-based compensation helped get someone uh, closer to their assigned pay range, but they're still below the minimum. There's another person who didn't get anything last year. Will these people have an opportunity to get closer to the target and maybe get their first pay range, uh, pay adjustment this year? What's our prospect for that? So first I would say, if they have a question about why that happened, they should reach out to their supervisors because we really want their questions to be answered. Um, and then second question, will there be a, another opportunity for an adjustment? That answer is yes. So um, remember, we I think the first year we got we tried to get everyone to uh, as close to 73 percent as we could, um, but we didn't get there for everyone. And so and we actually want to try to get higher than that. So, yes. Long answer to a short question. There will be another round. Okay, that looks like all the questions in the chat. Um, Rick, Shirley, Zach, do you have any final comments? Well, just to say thank you again for um, everything that you all do at the university. Um, we truly are committed to um, helping wherever we can. Um, uh, at our executive team meetings, we're, we're talking about how we can make improvements, um, not only to uh, students' experiences, but also our employee experiences. We have a new executive director that uh, Susan uh, introduced, um, uh, Vicki, um, uh, earlier uh, in, the, in this particular town hall. Um, uh, Vicki, I think, is going to, to bring some new ideas of how we can make even, even further improvements um, to employees' experiences here at Wichita State. Hey, I would just say one thing really quick. Andy and I have the opportunity to be in Topeka today to testify on workforce, and the chair of the committee opened it up, having the enrollment numbers just had been announced, and saying that <clears throat> it's really impressive what Wichita State has done in terms of enrollment, not just enrollment, but connecting those students into workforce. And, seeing just our growth compared to the rest of the system make me have an immense amount of pride in this institution. So I'm just really proud to be here and be with all of you. Yeah, I, the, you just took the words out of my mouth, Zach. I, I just want everyone to know how proud I, I, I am. And it, when we're out in the community, the number of people who have such high praise for what we're doing at Wichita State, I, I hope you are hearing it as well, but if you're not, please know that we are, and um, we know that it wouldn't be happening if it weren't for all of our great um, employees, faculty, staff, who are just who you are. So we appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, no, I'm sorry, not, go ahead, Susan. Yeah, no, I'm not seeing any more questions in the chat. So with that, I think, uh, Maybe we end our town hall and say adieu and uh, good work, everybody. <laughs> you all have a, a food drive fundraiser. Um, we do. Oh, yeah. let, let, let's plug that until well, I mean, October fourteenth. The staff have a food raise a food drive fundraiser. I don't hey. know if it's with you, you know. Just kidding, Susan. But yes, um, we're tying that in with Good Neighbor Week. We're going longer than a week to give more people time to do that. So we have. Um, drop-off boxes located all over campus. Um, the campus police, as I understand it, are going to help pick everything up when it's the drive is done to take that over to the Shocker Support Locker. It's it's looking great, and and so everybody should um, help participate in that. That really helps our students. 
and even some of our faculty and staff at certain times. So um, they have wish list items. Um, I remember last year they were like, please stop giving us green beans. So um, apparently grad student or grad students, sorry, I work in the grad school. Uh, apparently college students don't want green beans. So um, maybe a few do, but uh, so anyway, check all of that information out on the Shocker Locker page and they can certainly show you what you need to, what they would like to have, hygiene items, food items. It's, it's an awesome organization. So, um, and once again, the Senate, Staff Senate hopes to um, hold the mantle for the fourth year straight and, and win the challenge. No, Susan doesn't win it this year. Faculty, hey, be ballot collectors for the food drive. You know, <laughs> it's not illegal because it's not a vote. No, the only winners here are this are this people that use the shocker locker. So I am thrilled no matter who whose group wins, as long as we raise the 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 food products and the needs that they have over there. Yeah, please remember well, to bring stuff. Well, yes. We like the healthy competition here, so we'll, we we'll help support that too. Yeah, great. That's right. Take care, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Have a great afternoon. Hey, Caleb, how many people were on?